One of the few chemicals I regularly make rather than buy at the store or online is diethyl ether, which is more commonly just referred to as ether. Ether is an extremely volatile, dangerously flammable organic liquid that is often used as a laboratory solvent or as a starting fluid in some engines, and it's nearly impossible to buy, at least where I live. My main use for diethyl ether is as a solvent, which I'll talk about later in the video. Now to get started, I go ahead and add 100 milliliters of anhydrous ethanol to a 3 neck round bottom boiling flask along with a magnetic stir bar. I then add 80 milliliters of concentrated 98% sulfuric acid to an addition funnel and connect it to the center neck of the boiling flask so that I can slowly add it to the ethanol dropwise. This is done because sulfuric acid generates a lot of heat when it's mixed with ethanol and trying to add this much acid too quickly would cause it to violently boil which could result in a loss of product or even injury. To that end, I go ahead and close my funnel and transfer my flask to an ice bath for a few minutes every time it becomes hot to the touch. And alternatively, you could just make this addition directly in an ice bath, but it's tougher to show that on camera. Once all the sulfuric acid has been added, I go ahead and construct a distillation apparatus as shown here. You'll notice that on the center neck, I've connected a simple adapter linked to a Liebig condenser leading into a collection flask, while on the left neck, I've connected an addition funnel, and on the right neck, I've connected a thermometer. The idea here is that when I turn on my heating mantle and apply heat to the ethanol sulfuric acid mixture, they'll react to form diethyl ether. This reaction happens between 130 degrees Celsius and 145 degrees Celsius, while a temperature above 150 degrees Celsius will favor the formation of ethylene, which we don't want. With that in mind, the role of the thermometer being immersed in the reaction mixture itself is to monitor the temperature of the reaction throughout the entire process, which is critically important. Ether has a boiling point of just under 35 degrees Celsius, so almost immediately as it's formed, it will boil away. This ether vapor travels up the distillation head and is condensed back into a liquid which drips into my collection flask. And that's the role of the condenser column. Now before I discuss the role of the addition funnel, I need to explain a bit about how this reaction actually works. Most ether produced industrially is actually a product of the hydration of ethylene to ethanol. This process, however, is the opposite, and proceeds by dehydrating ethanol to ether using sulfuric acid in a three-step reaction. In the first step, sulfuric acid dissociates in solution, producing hydronium ions, which protonate the electronegative oxygen of the ethanol molecule, giving it a positive charge. In the second step, a nucleophilic oxygen atom of an unprotonated ethanol binds to the electrophilic protonated ethanol and simultaneously displaces one molecule of water, which makes this an SN2 reaction. In the third and final step, the ether molecule is deprotonated, which reforms the sulfuric acid catalyst and liberates gaseous diethyl ether. Now because this is an SN2 reaction, both the neutral ethanol and the protonated ethanol are required for the reaction to proceed, as their displacement of water is the rate-limiting step. Because of this, if all the ethanol was added at the beginning, you would produce some amount of ether and then be left with a flask containing nothing but sulfuric acid and protonated ethanol that's unable to further react. With that said, the purpose of the addition funnel is to continuously add more ethanol as diethyl ether is generated in order to maintain some degree of balance between the two in the reaction mixture. To that end, as soon as the temperature reaches 130 degrees Celsius and ether begins to distill over, I go ahead and open the stopcock just enough that it allows ethanol to drip into the reaction mixture at roughly the same rate that the ether is distilling over. This is very tough to maintain though, so I periodically adjust the heating mantle and drip rate as the distillation speeds up or slows down. While this is going on, I want to take a second to explain why I'm even making ether to begin with. Now, as I mentioned earlier, ether is mostly used as a car starting fluid and as a lab solvent. Historically though, ether was used as a general anesthetic that replaced chloroform due to its extreme toxicity. Ether was then subsequently replaced by newer non-flammable drugs such as halothane, which is still used to this day. During Prohibition, it was used extensively as an intoxicant, and it acts as a central nervous system depressant similar to alcohol, but distinctly different. As a solvent, ether is insanely useful, especially in liquid-liquid extractions. 
This is because ether is a nonpolar aprotic solvent, meaning it can dissolve nonpolar molecules extremely well without too much risk of reacting with them, and will then form a separate layer on top of water. Ether also has an incredible vapor pressure of 58.66 kilopascals at 20 degrees, which means it will evaporate extremely quickly, leaving behind any desired organic compound you extract with it. Diethyl ether is also a hard Lewis base due to its lone pairs. These can interact with and be used to dissolve Lewis acids such as iodine, phenol, trimethyl aluminum, or neutral cations such as the magnesium ion. This makes ether ideal for Grignard reactions as well. Overall, ether is a fantastic solvent despite its potential to form explosive aerosols, and I use it all the time. Anyway, I continue the reaction until I've added another 150 milliliters of ethanol, and then I cut the heat and disassemble my apparatus. In the collection flask, I have a crude mixture of diethyl ether, ethanol, and a bit of water. While the volume of water should be very low since sulfuric acid doesn't let go of water very easily at such low temperatures, I go ahead and add a few grams of anhydrous magnesium sulfate to remove any water that might have found its way over. After this was allowed to rest overnight, I decanted off my now very dry mixture of ether and alcohol to a new boiling flask and set it up for another distillation. In this step, I only want to collect anything that distills over below 38 degrees Celsius, and this should be very pure diethyl ether. Keep in mind if you want to make ether for a Grignard reaction, you only want to collect distillate below 36 degrees Celsius, and you also would probably want to use a fractional distillation column to eliminate alcohol completely. Anyway, this distillation is conducted at such a low temperature that you can easily touch any part of the apparatus, which is kind of weird to me. I go ahead and collect everything below 38 degrees Celsius and then switch out my collection flask and collect everything between 38 and 77 degrees Celsius, which should be a mixture of ethanol and ether. I then switch out my collection flask one final time and collect everything under 80 degrees Celsius, which should be mostly ethanol that I can reuse for making more ether. In the end, this is what I'm left with. And when I weigh my pure ether, I got a yield of 139 milliliters or 100.18 grams, which represents a 63.1% yield and a density of 0.72 grams per milliliter. This density is likely not accurate with such imprecise glassware, but it's close enough to tell me that my ether is mostly pure. As a final step, I go ahead and pour my ether into a brown glass bottle and then add to it the distillate collected between 38 and 77 degrees Celsius, along with a bit of a chemical called butylated hydroxytoluene. These final few steps are done to stabilize the diethyl ether for storage, and you want to skip these steps if you're using ether for a Grignard reaction. That said, these final steps are important, as diethyl ether will very slowly form explosive ether peroxides over the course of several months. The ethanol helps to inhibit this decomposition while the butylated hydroxytoluene is a reducing agent, and it will destroy these peroxides as they form. These impurities make very little difference if using ether as a solvent like I do, and I highly recommend taking these last few steps. In any case, that's all I have for today. I hope you found this video interesting or informative, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. I also want to thank Carter Scientific for supporting my work and providing me with some of the glassware I use, including that 200 milliliter graduated cylinder you saw me using. To everyone else, if you want to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.